Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure and um, to welcome all of you in this wonderful uh, panel on uh, transparency and legal design. My name is Sari De Pleo. I'm a lawyer, I'm a Brussels-based lawyer, and I'm a professor at Université Saint-Louis here in Brussels, right five minutes uh, from, from around here. I teach IP and media law, and I'm very, very happy that Rosanna put the, together this wonderful panel on this intriguing topic. So we're going to have this session on transparency and legal design organized by uh, UCL, uh, Université Catholique de Louvain, in Saint Louis, uh, well, our university. Uh, and I am very happy to be introducing all these wonderful panelists on this, uh, on this topic. It's um, what we're going to be doing. Um, we're going to have short presentations, about 10 minutes presentations of each of the panelists. And then we're going to open the floor to, uh, to the public. So if you have questions, you will have plenty of time, of course, to ask your questions and to, uh, to, to introduce yourselves. Um, it's not, probably not a, a coincidence that a panel on design has three Italians and a Finnish person. Very happy to introduce all of them. For starters, Rosanna Ducato, who's my colleague at San Louis, who's a postdoc researcher at, at uh, UCL in, uh, in San Louis, and who's going to uh, introduce her research a bit uh, in a more elaborate way uh, later on. Then uh, the first speaker as such will be Professor Monica uh, Palmira, uh, Palmirani. She's a full professor in legal informatics at the University of Bologna. She has a, a background in both computer science and law, so a very interesting combination. And she's working on privacy uh, by design in all these exciting new fields of technology, such as AI, uh, big data, uh, blockchain, etc. She will, she will uh, talk more about that later on. Then we will have a presentation by uh, Anti Inanen, who is uh, a co-founder and CEO at DOT. Uh, he's also a managing partner at Daughter Attorneys, based in Helsinki, but with uh, branches in uh, Berlin and San Francisco. And he's also the founder of the Legal Design Summit. So obviously he's thought a lot about the question as well, so that will be very exciting as well. More practical point of view. Then we have Ariana Rossi, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Bologna and the University of Luxembourg, who's been working on legal design and semantic web technologies, and who's worked a lot on visual representations of the information in the GDPR. So that will be quite interesting as well to have those first experiences. Then we will have Tom Ford, who is the executive uh, director of the Fordham Center on Law and Information Policy at the Fordham University School of Law. And he's at the same time the senior researcher on the Usable Privacy Project. So very interesting as well to have an American perspective. And then finally, we will have uh, Christoph Sch uh, Schmon, who is the senior legal officer at Buick. So he's uh, uh, the leader of the consumer rights team at Buick, the, the European consumer uh, organization. He works a lot on consumer law, uh, well, all the, uh, the consumer law related aspects of new technologies. He's been working a lot on product liability and on AI. So very, very happy to uh, be hearing all these, uh, these, these presentations and looking forward to some of the very interesting questions from the room. Thank you. Thanks, Sari, for this nice uh, introduction. Uh, I'm Rossana Ducato, and I'm really happy to be here and to have the possibility to introduce this stellar panel. Uh, but, uh, well, I must admit, I'm personally and professionally interested in the discussion that, uh, that we are going to have uh, because uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher and I'm uh, uh, running um, at uh, UCL and uh, San Louis University where we are running a legal design project called the Internet of Platforms, a study, uh, an empirical study on private ordering and consumer protection in the sharing economy. Well, the aim of this project is to address the lack of transparency that we are experiencing in our uh, current practice in the online uh, environment. And one practical outcome of this project is to develop a smart, a smart disclosure system, well, the be aware, uh, up uh, uh, with the aim to uh, enhance the information users receive from and about online platforms. 
And through a legal design uh, approach, uh, the solution aims to translate terms and conditions and privacy policy from the complex legalese in a more meaningful way for uh, the user. And how? Well, uh, identifying and extracting the key points uh, of, the, of the contract and uh, uh, highlighting uh, whether there are unfair or unenforceable conditions, and also by rating the legal quality of the terms of services and privacy policy. Well, this is my small personal parenthesis about legal design, but why transparency matters, why we are here today? Well, the principle of transparency is a fundamental principle in EU law, particularly in the data protection and consumer protection legislation. Information transparency is designed as a necessary feature of mandated disclosures. And mandated disclosure is a widespread policy technique which obliges the data controller and the trader to provide some info, certain information to the weak party so that he can, the, the, the person can understand the uh, meaning and the legal consequences of the transaction. The principle is easy, I would say. It's uh, uh, easy to understand because if information is accessible, clear, and understandable, so mandated disclosure can effectively inform the consumer, the data subject, about the essential content of the, of the agreement and allow her to make optimal decisions and uh, uh, express a meaningful consent. In this sense, mandated disclosure and the principle of transparency are two sides of the same coin because uh, the substantial requirement, the obligation to provide certain information can uh, work only if complemented by the formal requirement. So only if information is provided in a clear and intelligible way, which means an information that a consumer or data subject can easily understand without legal advice. However, well, we know that the situation is not that uh, simple and uh, we know actually the, uh, how the current reality it is. But uh, we are here today uh, because our research hypothesis, I would say, uh, is that legal design can help to fix the problems of mandated disclosures and can help the implementation of the principle of transparency in practice. But. Uh, probably for some of you, it's the first time that you hear the word legal design. So I'd like to hand over to Professor Palmirani, who is going to introduce us to the scientific foundation of this uh, user-centered and interdisciplinary field. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so. My presentation is um, about the Legal Design Manifesto. I'm very happy to introduce uh, this uh, talk uh, concerning manifesto, <laughs> with the word manifesto. Uh, let me introduce the history of this manifesto and where the idea came from. So several uh, colleagues, a researcher and PhD, started seven more or less years ago to investigate, uh, to use uh, visualization techniques, uh, human interaction, computer human interaction techniques, uh, and also um, other design uh, codification of the visual arts uh, uh, for simplifying uh, legal documents. So <coughs> the main idea is uh, now to take uh, the best practices uh, coming from those empirical projects uh, that you can see uh, some uh, important university or laboratory or uh, actors in these slides uh, and to create uh, the premises and the foundation for transforming legal design in a discipline. Or better, in a community that follows some characteristics, uh, approaches, and uh, uh, foundationals uh, in order to create uh, uh, also an academy, academic uh, uh, community, and also a practitioner uh, community. So, mm -hmm. next. So, nothing better to start uh, from a theory for uh, uh, creating a, a practical things. So, I believe in that. Uh, and uh, for this reason, uh, I launched the idea inside of my colleagues to uh, create uh, some uh, manifesto, one manifesto that can list uh, some uh, foundational issues. 
And um, sorry, next back. And uh, well, uh, with those colleagues, uh, we started uh, to create uh, this manifesto and to uh, start to the question what the legal design is. And in case uh, we uh, start with the discipline in the search field, uh, which characteristics do we need? Also, because we are talking about law, and law is a long historical discipline, so we need to not uh, uh, lose uh, the theoretical part of uh, law and uh, uh, we need to combine uh, different uh, disciplines and, and different uh, new uh, visual uh, uh, artistic uh, uh, codification. So legal design uh, is an interdisciplinary uh, area where the human-centered design is a main uh, issue to uh, create a solution, practical solution to a citizen in order to understand the law document uh, or legal document in general, or legal messages, or also policy. We are talking about GDPR and also transparency. One of the other pillars is the communication. Communication is not a trivial task. We need to communicate a legal message, not a simple visual message, but also legal concept and legal message. And uh, for doing that, we need the legal theory and the philosophy of law principles uh, at the foundational part, uh, the, the pillars uh, on, the, on the basis uh, we can uh, build uh, the other parts uh, of the discipline. So uh, for now, uh, for, for us, uh, the legal design uh, needs uh, human-computer interaction, uh, document information design, semantic web techniques, uh, because uh, is not limited to visual icons or similar visualization, but we need also to codify those legal knowledge inside of the semantic web, machine readable. And so to track the transparency and the explainability of those message, not limited to the visual, but also for the machine, taking in consideration artificial intelligence. So on the visual icon connected to ontologies and connected to for instance, a metadata that explain to the other machine the meaning of that, these icons and visualization. And also, as I said before, privacy and ethics, uh, philosophy of law, semiotic and communication. So the area is very large, uh, but uh, we need also to have a practical, empirical approach because we need to stay very close to the citizen and to the legal uh, domain of uh, practitioners uh, that uh, day by day need a uh, very simple documentation, usable and understandable. So we have two aspects, uh, theoretical aspect, uh, very basic foundation and some principle coming from uh, discipline historically uh, very strong in that, but with empirical approach in order to be very close to the citizen in uh, this design. So for this reason, we uh, produce a manifesto that you can find uh, in uh, the web and is open to your comments and an alliance. So what does it mean? Uh, we pretend, we intend to have a community with all the stakeholders on board in order to have all the angles of the perspective uh, necessary for building this kind of new discipline and also to improve uh, tools uh, and create guidelines uh, for the future for the over-the-top companies, for instance, but also SMEs, not limited to the top. And um, so we can find inside of the manifesto uh, several uh, principles that uh, I have no time to uh, introduce you in details, but you can find in the website. So human-centered uh, approach is obviously the main pillar of our activities, but also proactive, ex-ante uh, methodology, not ex-post methodology. And also theoretical based uh, and open access, what does it mean? That every uh, icons and um, ontology and uh, metadata are available for the control thesis and control analysis because we want it to be transparent also in the path of the creation of such a, a, a set of icons. And uh, we have also purposes, uh, clarity, trust, uh, scientific based. Again, everything uh, we want to be replicated and uh, re re remakeable not uh, uh, like a black box, but uh, any icons is not or visualization must to produce the motivation and any 
person can assess to those motivations in order to avoid manipulation through using uh, the, the visualization uh, area. And uh, finally, we have uh, some uh, practical approach, uh, prototyping, <coughs> empirical standards and patterns uh, in order to reuse as much as possible uh, inside of the same communities, some patterns, uh, and semantic web-based. Uh, so not limited to the human comprehension, but also by machine. And so the, the machine can understand from our interaction uh, the real meaning of the visualization. Okay, now I have um, another important um, uh, consideration. Uh, legal design, uh, try to create a visualization of the legal concept. Uh, so it's not uh, limited to create a, a good image or to capture the attention like at advertising. It's not similar to marketing. It's not uh, advertising. I can create a, a good image and I can capture the attention of my citizen on the privacy with a, a red blinking box, but it's not our goal. Our goal is to vehiculate, to communicate the legal concept. So what I can see in some project is the attention only on the path icons to end user. If the end user is happy and the icon is quite nice, uh, company are happy, but the lawyers not, because uh, the icon is, doesn't represent uh, the legal concept. So in our domain, we want to start uh, to the conceptualization of the message uh, under the law, or the rule of law, the principle of the law, like transparency, like uh, the right of the data subject, uh, data portability, some examples and to pass through the iconization and visualization in order to embed it inside of the icons of visualization, those principles, and to find the best uh, visualization where the end user can in understand uh, not simply position inside of the text, not a simple nice uh, uh, image, but the, the image itself helps the end user to understand the legal concept. This is very challenging. <laughs> Very, but uh, the idea is also to have everything codified in uh, semantic web uh, technologies in order to provide uh, all the paths uh, trackable, transparent in any step. Okay, this is a, a, a slide from my colleague Margaret Hagan that say time to time we need to break uh, the traditional law concepts, uh, right? But uh, the main principle is uh, the theoretical aspect of the law, of the rule of law, is a part uh, of the iconization and visualization of legal design. With in mind a new future of the representation of that uh, in Nedit Ferman. So, some principle. Uh, legal designing is not advertising. Totally, totally. It's not a part of the company for making happy the, the citizen. But uh, we need to find the best techniques for embedding uh, legal concepts and not manipulating uh, using visualization the behaviors and the decision path of the citizen. Okay? So time to time we are very attracted by uh, icons or some image, but we don't understand why and we react immediately. We don't want this kind of legal design. It's not a reaction, emotional reaction. It's a legal design for vehicle to communicate legal concept. Uh, ethical principles are necessary. And in our manifesto, ethics are very important. Traceability, transparency, explainability, why this icon represents the legal concept. And finally, customization for target, uh, like minors, for instance, or others. And the idea is to use, uh, perhaps, uh, is, a, is a starting idea, the new, new theory. New theory is a, a sort of a new paternalistic uh, theory that is, means uh, a gentle recommendation to, to act in a positive manner without compress uh, the, the freedom of decision of each individual. So this is a new theory, so not uh, aggressive like advertising, not aggressive like the marketing, not in the hand totally of the company, of the market, but in the hand of those people of, of the law that would like to communicate the legal concept. So this is a manifesto, is open to your comment. 
you can see the link here and also an explanation uh, by Margaret uh, Hagen that uh, um, re resume, recapple the main pillars of, of our manifesto in this post. And um, as a group, uh, we have in mind to uh, organize a lot of events and probably also a, not a summer school or winter school, we, we need to decide, but also um, capacity building on that uh, in order to create a community capable to implement uh, in practice uh, those uh, principles. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Palmirani, for this uh, really broad and rich introduction to the field of legal design. But I would like to tell you that uh, legal design is becoming increasingly important also in the legal practice. And luckily, we have here Antti Inanen, uh, who is going to explain us how legal design has changed its work in his law firm. Thank you. Hopefully, you can all hear me. It's snowing like crazy in Finland at the moment, but it's good to see that I bought the good weather here too. Russell also, so I'm a corporate lawyer, so I might have a different uh, point of view to legal design here. Uh, I run Dottir Attorneys in Helsinki. We have 30 lawyers there and uh, small offices in San Francisco and in Berlin and in Paris also. Um, I stumbled upon legal design maybe four years ago. I thought I invented it, but I'm not <laughs> ashamed to admit that I didn't. I was organizing a disco with my uh, colleague, with my friend, you know, kids disco, it can be a little bit boring then. He was running a big service design agency and we started talking and uh, he said like, does it always have to be uh, communicated like this? Does the law always have to look like this? And I tried to defend lawyers, of course, and and make my arguments and we we tried to uh, we started understanding each other and I thought like there must be something to it you know like law is just poorly designed lawyers don't work with designers there might be something that lawyers could actually learn from working with designers from other professions currently law firms are full of lawyers you know if you have seen a law firm they are you know big law firms are full of lawyers they have hundreds of lawyers and they're recruiting more and I'm like, do you, are you sure that you need one lawyer more? Wouldn't it be good to get some other professions also in the field of law? And that's what's happening also, I think, in field of legal design. So we started, so we started uh, talking and uh, we thought like, okay, let's try applying strategic design principles in the field of law and let's see how it works. And uh, I came home and I was super excited and I Googled a little bit and of course there were a lot of people doing it also before me, but, but then we started to like um, play with the idea if this was good for our corporate clients also. And we thought like, okay, we might learn something from it and implement into our own very traditional work too. So, um, so we started with the, with the idea, we organized one seminar and it was super popular so we knew that we were on to something like normally when i organize a seminar let's say i uh, ip right seminar or something like that maybe eight to ten people depending on what, what you know how if there's alcohol or not you know <laughs> I will, will end up coming these ones were super popular all, people all over from the world from kuwait from from australia flew to finland when it was, you know, the weather is horrible in Finland when we organized the seminar, so uh, we knew that we were onto something, right? Um, then we managed to score a couple of good um, clients who were really interested, who, who we piloted the, uh, the idea with. For me, legal design is, is, is a different kind of process of delivering legal services. So if you think of regular legal work, it's very top-down. Clients call me, I will give them answers based on what I know. Legal design comes from a very different kind of uh, point of view. Designers don't usually design anything before doing some kind of research. And that's different, and that's perhaps something that lawyers could learn from also. Like, they refuse to design anything before they have done some research. They're like, how am I supposed to design if I don't know what the client or the client's client and that's something that we've, we've been trying to implement into our, our work also. And um, I think that was a great point also, being very ethical and ensuring the uh, legal side of things also when you are designing something. 
So in all of the teams, we have designers working together with lawyers. So I refuse to call it legal design if there is not a legal part and a design part there also. So all the, all the teams are very multidisciplinary also and very diverse. We recruited three designers, which was a, like a leap of faith from our firm. And it has been really eye-opening also. They see things very differently than regular lawyers do. Plus, it's a lot of fun to work with different kind of people too. I want to present you like a concrete example here. Uh, the client is uh, Estee Lauder. Uh, they own 28 different brands, right? So we were super happy when we got this client. We're just like mind, mind blown. Like they want us to redesign their, uh, their uh, privacy policies. Then we started looking into this one and like, okay, it might be a little bit more complex. Like we have one big client and then we have 28 sub clients here. And we're, you know, designing something new for all of them. Like how, how do you, like then you can't really use those top down systems. I can't really tell them like, okay, here's your new privacy policy because it might not suit their needs. There will be resistance and, uh, and you need different kind of process for this kind of uh, assignment too. So they had focus groups, they had millennial boards also, and we could use those groups also. So, so we uh, expanded the problem. We presented the current uh, privacy policy to the millennial group and to the focus groups and got their information, did the first prototype. Then did a validation workshop with the client. How does your IT system work? How do the different brands, how, how are they structured? Can you do this one? The, how, uh, is it uh, feasible for you to deliver? And little by little, by doing these like prototypes, we got closer and closer to the uh, to the final final version, which they are going to eventually roll out. Uh, on the right side, uh, you see the old version. That's all. That's uh, all. Uh, I think thirty pages long. If you look at it from your iPhone, it's over thirty screens long. But legally, the quality is top notch. You know the. Policy was drafted by a very, very talented lawyer working in a magic circle firm. Like, I looked at it, and like, I was like, you know, in terms of like legal stuff, you know, there's not much I can add here. And, you know, it was over 30 pages long, so maybe adding like one page wouldn't be, you know, very impactful either. But, you know, it was well drafted. But the millennial group and the focus group said like, okay, it's too in-depth. Like, we need to redesign this one. So this is how the, the, um, the prototype looks like. We actually cut it down to five different streams of information. A lot of this is also about creating some kind of like user experience or user interface on top of the existing documents. We didn't change much of the original policy, but now it's organized better, it's layered, there is a better user experience in my opinion. This is how it actually looks like. This is, this is a picture from our office. It might not be so glamorous after all. You know, we work with scissors and glue and we actually like, like physically cut the information into different, <coughs> different kind of like streams. We try to identify like three to five different information streams and just, you know, manually cut the, uh, cut the privacy policy for, for those streams. And um, yeah, this is how legal design looks in action. Not very impressive, but you know, it can be a lot of fun also, I, I, I admit that. And here's the final version, I, and, I, and I think that you know, in terms of icons, we wanted to give like, brands also flexibility, so we designed kind of like a modular privacy policies for them, for, and they have a set of icons that they, uh, they can uh, choose from that represent the, uh, the uh, uh, different uh, information streams there. So for me, it's also, it's working in multidisciplinary teams, working together with designers and lawyers, and using uh, design methods to actually connect with the client and find out what they want, and prototyping, and then expanding the problem, prototyping again, expanding the problem, and using also the client's resources in you know, discovering the actual client needs. And little by little, you know, this is, a, this is the version that we have now. Maybe the next version will be more digital. Maybe they'll start b building tech around this one. That's also like uh, something that I would like to see, like continuous improvement. 
at some point we're going to laugh at the situation where we are at the moment. That, do, like, do you remember the time when there used to be websites with privacy policies that were over 30 pages long. It's, it's not going to be like this always. And they're like, uh, but, but it's, it's difficult to make those like big systemic changes also because so many people are typically involved in it. For that kind of like involvement, I think that the legal uh, design process is very uh, powerful too because it actually listens to people and then you can create something that is maybe a little bit of higher quality than the, than the previous one. So that's, that's my uh, example. Thanks. Thank you very much, Antti. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, my comment is that uh, who said the lawyers are not creative. Uh, <laughs> well, um, following the path of transparency, uh, now I'm really glad to introduce uh, Arianna Rossi. Uh, just to give you a few words about her work. Well, um, if you read carefully the GDPR, I know that sometimes it's a hard task, but if you read it, it's possible to see some behavioral insights in some of its provision. We live in an age where we derive information rather than from lengthy mandatory disclosure from icons and pictures. And there is a provision in the GDPR where it is laid down the possibility to complement the text of the privacy notice with machine readable icons. And Arianna is going to uh, explain, uh, explain us what she did in her research project for her PhD. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here and to be able to explain in the next five minutes what I've been doing for the last three years. Um, so um, I come from the University of Bologna. I also have a double affiliation with the University of Luxembourg. And I'm part of a beautiful program, which is called LAJD, uh, Law, Science and Technology. So highly interdisciplinary. I see some of my colleagues here. Some of them have finished. Some of them are still on the way. Um, and um, yes, uh, under the supervision of Professor Monica Palmirani, we have been working on a data protection icon set. Um, and I'm uh, trying to, well, I've, we've heard a lot already about legal design, and I will try to give a very practical implementation of how a legal design cycle, well, a design cycle applied to legal, uh, to the legal field can work in practice inside of a research um, institute like the university. Um, and this is motivated from the uh, Legal Design Lab at Stanford University, um, which is run by Margaret Hagen, which also had an important role in our project, as I will show you in a while. Um, and I will, um, so I will try to um, explain how we went through uh, this challenge of creating data protection icons uh, for, the, uh, for, for, the, for the GDPR um, in a machine-readable way. So first of all, uh, the first stage is to discover what are the challenges and w on which points you would like to focus and what are the challenges that you would like to solve and that you're able to solve. And there are also some constraints. So for us, we know that information paradigm has a lot of problems. We're not the first ones to say that. It's been like decades and decades of research about that. Um, and we decided to focus on two particular problems. One of that is that usually uh, there is no information design in privacy policies in the sense that privacy policies are usually presented as a wall of text, which is impenetrable to the human eye, which means there are no affordances, no ways for the human eye to actually you know, feel like reading this text. Um, and this is really uh, something that works against the will of people to be informed about their rights. Um, and the second uh, problem is that, uh, well, these documents are really, really, really long. So even if you're looking for a specific kind of information, it's impossible to find it. Or, well, you lose your patience before you can find it. Um, and as Rosanna was saying, there is a specific provision of the implementation of the principle of transparency, which calls about, which, which talks about icons. So why don't we use icons to give a meaningful, a meaningful overview um, of the intended processing? Well. Can we do that? This is the first question that we had. Um, so uh, then we um, narrow down um, the um, research questions that we wanted to tackle. Uh, of course, we couldn't tackle the whole problem, but we you know, contributed to a solution. And the first research questions was about how can we create, what kind of technologies we can use for machine-readable icons, 
and we're really lucky in that because the University of Bologna is uh, very good in research for about legal semantic tech, uh, legal semantic web technologies. Um, the second question was about how do we create these icons? Is there a methodology we can follow so that all the relevant stakeholders are taken into account? Um, and the third one was about evaluation of icons. So how does do these icon icons work? Um, and then, of course, the question is, what does it mean? Do they work? So um, we um, live in a place where usually um, documents are lawyer readable. Um, we have been doing a lot of research about machine readable uh, legal documents. Um, but uh, what, well, lawyers can read them, machines can read them. So what about the rest of the humanity? Um, so we still have to work a bit on that. Of course, as we've seen, there are a lot of um, um, initiatives arising. Um, and what we chose, it was also a very specific uh, frame, let's say. So what kind of functions do we want our icons to have? Uh, we decided, we adopted, let's say, a pretty conservative um, position in a sense, in the sense that we didn't want to disrupt the legal text, we didn't touch the legal text, but we worked on the information architecture. And uh, the function of our icons uh, are that, uh, is that they accompany the text so that they help the reader to go through the text, to skim through the text, and to find the information he's looking for. Um, and uh, to give, um, to make these icons, let's say, machine readable, and to make the, um, the, 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 the text also machine readable, we have to uh, feed the computer with some semantic information that it can understand. Um, we created an ontology of um, the GDPR, which is like a, a computational formalization of it. It describes the concepts of the GDPR, the definitions, and the relations among the concepts. I won't go into detail now, um, right now, but I just want to point out the fact that we decided to um, focus on uh, some specific modules of this um, ontology, on which we then created the icons. So we form you formalize some concepts, and then we created the icons for those concepts. And in specifically, we decided to focus on the rights of the data subjects, on the uh, processing operations on the processing purposes, on the legal basis for processing, um, and on the people that are involved in the processing. Um, how do, do we create the icons? Well, um, we didn't have exactly clear ideas in the, in the beginning, but we, um, we were at Stanford Law School and we started this um, experimentation, let's say, with uh, uh, Margaret Hagen. Um, and we decided to resort to participatory design, which means that you involve all the relevant stakeholders into the design of a certain artifact. So not only designers are the people that are able to design something, but also the users of a certain artifact can um, provide valuable insights. For us, it, means, it meant also to be highly multidisciplinary because we wanted to uh, involve all the different opinions and needs and, um, and, and visions and, and also uh, goals. So so we had lawyers on board, we had designers, we had computer scientists, of course, because many of the uh, notions of the GDPR are highly technical. Uh, we had also like interested uh, um, citizens um, and also a few representatives from um, companies, so from enterprise world. Uh, well, and how does it work? Well, you usually um, try to create very um, low fidelity prototypes in the sense that, well, for example, as you can see, we were literally um, sketching our ideas, on the boards, they're like you can erase them, but on the walls, um, and um, and then we were reiterating. You know, we were just trying to understand whether the ideas that we were having were good. And when we reached a certain consensus, then we uh, evaluated our hypothesis. Um, and we also uh, decided to focus on two very um, specific dimensions of icons. We can, you can evaluate icons on a lot of dimensions. We uh, decided to uh, focus on legibility and comprehensibility of icons. A lot of problems there. I won't go into detail now, but I'm open to questions afterwards. And what happens is that you then refine your uh, initial hypothesis on the basis of your evaluation, of course. So, for example, this is a, um, as you can see on the left side, there is a, let's say, the first um, prototype of the right to data portability. Um, well, uh, it was very detailed, um, as you can see, um, in the sense that, uh, well, we, as I was saying, we tried to listen to all the different needs of the different uh, people. So, well, lawyers, when they visualize something, they want it to be very, very specific, as the legal text can be. 
Um, of course, you cannot do this in an icon. Uh, and also, they wanted it to be very literal, so literal meaning, so that you know you don't have to um, make a, 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 a very big step in interpretation. Um, otherwise, we risk that the, the the message is misinterpreted. But of course, this cannot work, especially not in an icon. So this is why we got a lot of you know feedback, negative feedback, and we have elaborated over the the the, the continuous of the over the. Um, the, the following design, um, participatory design workshops, we re-elaborated our hypothesis so that we went uh, into uh, you know, some more usable, um, um, let's say, uh, dimensions. And also we started to use uh, visual metaphors to uh, communicate in a very uh, reduced space, uh, very complex meanings. Um, of course, there are problems also there. Um, so, as I was saying, then we run other participatory design workshops, uh, and I'm very happy to, to um, say that we've also involved the Academy of Fine Arts of Bologna, uh, and all these young designers, and we're telling them, you know, they've discovered a lot about the, lo the legal world, and the, the legal world of our university discovered a lot about the design world, so it was a very fruitful and interesting experience. Um, and then also we went on to, with other user testing, um, we run like three or four of them, so it's, you know, it, my point is that we, it's an iterative cycle, so you cannot, maybe you never reach the perfection, right? So you can reach a, a point where you are satisfied according to some dimensions that you have established before. Um, this is just an example of what the data subjects rights um, look like. Uh, of course, there have been arbitra arbitrary choices uh, that we couldn't uh, escape. Um, and everything is debatable, but we can explain exactly why we made some iconographical choices. And then, um, I just want to point out the fact that there is a research website uh, if you're curious about our publications and the icon set is on that, you can download that. Um, Tomorrow, I'm going to present the, um, the research in much more detail uh, in uh, Area 42 Petit uh, in late afternoon. If you're curious about that, I invite you to be there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ariana. I'll definitely come. I really think that your project is brilliant, truly. Uh, but uh, OK, that was just my personal opinion. Um, <laughs> now, I am really uh, happy to give the floor to Tom Norton, for a university. Well, uh, actually, the talk of Tom uh, would be a sort of uh, a creati creative deconstruction of, of what we have seen so far <laughs> regarding legal design. Uh, uh, Tom and uh, his team are doing a really fantastic job at Forum in the usable privacy project. I'm sure that you already know that. And uh, thanks to the experience they gained, uh, he can actually uh, explain us what are the current obstacles to the development of meaningful privacy indicators and will suggest some recommendation to move forward. Thank you. Um, like all the rest of the panel, I'm very happy to be here and I'm, I'm glad you're all uh, in attendance to hear the talk. Um, again, I'm Tom Norton from um, Fordham University School of Law in New York City. I'm the executive director of the Center on Law and Information Policy there. And I'm here to present uh, my team and I's research on trustworthy privacy indicators. Um, and when we use the term privacy indicators, we don't mean just icons, but also the other systems of scores, labels, grades, or certifications that are out there and exist and have been attempted. Um, and I'm not alone in this work. My colleagues, um, uh, Joel Reidenberg, Cameron Russell, and, and some of our, our other student workers um, have worked on this specific research with me, so I'm here to represent them as well today. Um, and I'm also here to represent the Usable Privacy Project, which, in case you're not familiar with it, is a, uh, it's a multidisciplinary uh, effort between lawyers and computer scientists to study <coughs> privacy policies and improve their usability. Um, so as an overview of what our specific project and my talk today uh, We'll do what, what our work does is explores the obstacles to, to the development of privacy indicators, um, specifically those that have already existed already. Um, and we also recommend requirements for successful development and deployment of an, any indicator system. Just as an overview of what I'll talk about today, first I'll break down uh, the taxonomy of indicators that we've defined through our research. Uh, I'll briefly describe the goals for the various indicator systems that are out there or have been attempted. Uh, then I'll get into more detail about the obstacles for their success. 
and our recommendations. So starting with our taxonomy, we've identified really four different types of indicators that are out there. Um, the first ones are grades and scores. Um, so examples of these are terms of service didn't read or privacygrade.org. And these systems at their most basic level will, will assign a grade or a score to a, a website based on, based on its privacy policy and, and what it's said therein. Um, another type of system has been labels and icons. So examples of these would be um, the nutrition label, privacy nutrition label system developed by Professor Lori Craner at Carnegie Mellon, um, or Mozilla's icons, for example. Uh, certification regimes and seals, those are um, along the lines of TrustArc or Trustee. Um, and dashboards would be something like that offered by AVG, Privacy Fix, or Ghostery. You might be familiar with many or all those examples. Now behind these, these indicator systems are a, a set of goals that we've identified. One is to obviously provide more meaningful notice to consumers, to uh, give consumers and users information about what's in a privacy statement without actually having to refer to the privacy statement to get that information. Uh, and similarly to this, uh, this empowers consumers, empowers consumer choice, about whether they want to use an app or a service or not based on uh, the stated privacy practices. Um, and also it nudges consumers and, and businesses alike uh, to, to improve or change their privacy practices based on the transparency through, through the statements that as exposed by the indicators. I'd like to get into the obstacles in a little bit more detail now as that's the, the focal point of the presentation. Um, and our research has really revealed four main obstacles. One is a lack of standardization. Uh, uh, deficiencies with scoring criteria when scoring and grading policies, uh, difficulties interpreting policy language, uh, and problems with reliability when it comes to the agents and entities that are rating or grading policies. I'll break these down in, in more detail. So lack of standardization. Uh, I think I, I mentioned six or eight efforts in, in the examples when describing the taxonomy, and that's just a limited set. Um, but you can already see when you have when you have multiple uh, efforts out there, it's always apples and oranges. No two are the same. No two are built on or relying on the same criteria. Um, it becomes a densely populated landscape. Um, and it can even be limited to particular apps or services or platforms. Um, and, and, and when you have so many out there, it really obscures the visibility of some. Um, the paradox of choice, I guess you would call it, or it, just the inability to choose one or one will bury another in, in the landscape. Uh, and, and from that, it becomes a confusing landscape. Um, it's difficult to learn multiple indicators and in what they do and to internalize how they work. Uh, and that really would disincentivize dis, uh, consumers from adopting any one in particular, uh, if not more than one. Uh, and moving on to the next category, um, evaluating scoring, scoring criteria deficiencies. So this is especially important when it comes to indicator systems that try to assign grades or scores uh, to, to a particular website based on what's in the policy. Um, and and two, two micro problems that are within this are, are when it comes to selecting the criteria that you grade a policy on or assign a score based on, um, and then difficulties weighing those criteria. So. Uh, when you're selecting grading criteria, there are problems that, ar that arise uh, when the breadth is, is different from one uh, indicator to another. So how many types of data practices are you going to look for when you're trying to assign a grade or a score to a policy? Um, how are you going to decide based on different types of services, what types of, um, what types of information you're looking for? Um, here's another, it's another apples and oranges problem where you, where you have no two that are alike and it's, there's no standardization between, between these. And then another problem is weighing the criteria. Once you have decided upon the criteria on which you'll base a grade or a score, uh, how do you decide what, what weight to give, to give one criterion over the other? Is one data practice uh, worth more weight in a grade or a score than another one based on risk? Or should they all be assigned equally? Um, if, you, if, you, if you assign equal weights to different criteria, then you run the risk of um, one particularly bad or 
um, risky data practice being outweighed by lots of also uh, lots of good statements in the policy as well. Um, now, now all these highlight the need for standardization uh, and the importance of standardization when it comes to comes to this work. Um, the next the next obstacle is interpretive issues. Uh, so privacy policies and privacy statements are written by lawyers. They're in text that's uh, vague and difficult to understand. And this is especially true when we're talking about these problems in the context of uh, the, the artificial intelligence and the machine learning that goes on uh, to interpret these policies and, and ultimately uh, lead to a grade or a score. Um, first of all, the, the technological tools uh, often have taken a non-holistic approach uh, to, to analyzing policy text. So the tools will read snippets of a policy statement um, or, or small parts of it. And this is contrary to le uh, legal principles that, that say you should read a legal document as a whole and give meaning to all terms and give effect to all terms. Um, also, the technological tools uh, we found uh, have difficulty with vagueness and ambiguity in modal language and policy statements um, and in interpreting things like silence in a privacy policy um, and applying legal defaults related to the use of that type of language. So for example, silence in a policy about a particular practice is not prohibitive, prohibitive. it's arguably permissive if a policy doesn't say that a company can't do a particular thing and a company may do that thing. And machine learning and the technological tools have difficulty picking up on that nuance. Um, in another issue with, another interpretive issue, and this is backing away from the technological element and reverting back more to the human side because any technological tool will rely on human input at some point, um, is annotator consistency. Um, so the people who are actually going through privacy policies and um, providing the input data that the technical tools use to learn, um, there's inconsistency among human annotators when it comes to privacy policy uh, interpretation. Expert readers and lay readers, research has shown, have uh, lots of disagreements about what policies say, about what policies mean. Um, even within groups of experts or within groups of lay people, there are, there are uh, interpretive differences. Um, and then further, even if there is agreement between uh, annotators, uh, there still remains the fact that people can differ on the importance of uh, various data practices based on, based on their own contextual preferences. Um, and the final, final one is rating, rating agent reliability. Um, so on the most general level, um, is, is the entity who's providing a rating uh, sustainable in the long term financially? Are they sustainable uh, in their ability to provide the labor that it takes to maintain the system in the long term? Um, and, and, and baked into this is the concept of fidelity, too. Uh, for example, in 2014, the Federal Trade Commission uh, in the states fined uh, trustee um, for failing to recertify policies in contravention uh, of their data practices um, and find it for holding out as a nonprofit when, when that was no longer the case. Um, so those are also questions of reliability and, and also trust. And finally, moving on to our recommendations based on our, what our research has shown these obstacles to be, we provide a set of recommendations. The first is to uh, provide standardization, Law lawmakers, and policymakers and regulators should establish a standardized set of evaluation criteria so that indicator systems aren't comparing apples and oranges. Um, they're comparing apples to apples. So uh, users uh, can go from platform to service uh, and, and get a consistent evaluation of what they're using. Um, also, we need to establish standardized rating techniques, and that involves standardized scoring criteria standardized weighting. Um, the second recommendation is that the indicator system must convey something that's important. Uh, it should be either actual data practices, um, but these would have to be discerned by technical tools um, or simply what a policy states. Now, this second, um, the second 
position would shift the burden on the user to uh, resolve interpretive and uh, interpretive issues around amb ambiguity and vagueness. Um, and then third, uh, we need a, a development of sta uh, standardized icons, um, what they would look like, where they should be placed on a web page or in an app, uh, and what the technical requirements of those might be. Uh, and finally, um, reliable, autonomous, and sustainable uh, entities who are providing these indicators. Thanks a lot, Tom. Uh, I really think that this kind of research is uh, really needed right now, and uh, you uh, presented that brilliant overview. Now, last but not least, and in this case I really mean it, uh, um, we, are, we have the pleasure to welcome Christoph Schmon. Christoph is going to untangle a Gordian knot because uh, uh, probably the field where transparency is more needed is AI. And uh, I, I think that um, the legal design can uh, uh, usefully uh, be uh, applied for opening the famous blacks, black box. So we are going to listen with great curiosity uh, to Christoph, who is going to contribute with his perspective as a consumer advocate. Thank you, Rosanna. Further work, yes. I see a certain information fatigue already in your audience, and I know that it's kind of us that stands between you and the lunch, so I will try to be <laughs> very quick. Um, I would like to bring in into this discussion on transparency the dimension of algorithmic decision making a bit. And I think ADM can be a challenge for transparency, but also a way to achieve transparency. To the challenge, um, we've learned a lot now about this idea of data protection law that information must be intelligible, must be submitted in a clear and plain language. Um, I have to disappoint many of you perhaps, but this is not new. It's not a revolution. It's a copy base of consumer law that we have for decades in the European Union, and consumer law has struggled ever since to give meaning to this concept, to the information pillar, the information paradigm. Like traders must provide certain pieces of information if you go for online shopping about the price or the characteristics of a service. Um, but many, and among them behavioral economists and lawyers and legal design experts, have criticized that impersonalized information will not necessarily reduce this asymmetry of information, bargaining power, and knowledge. You know, that the, the advantage of the seller vis-a-vis -vis the consumer, the advantage of the data processor vis-a-vis -vis the data subject. And the yardstick under EU law if you ask yourself the question, intellig intelligible for whom, is the average consumer. It is the average user most likely under the GDPR. And an average consumer, at least if we follow what the European Court of Justice says, it has been... Five minutes remaining. Thank you. <laughs> and has been uncourt in consumer law. An average consumer is very keen to learn, keen to access information, is able to understand and process it and get knowledge out of it. That's super unrealistic. No one understands in terms of service, and no one is interested in it. So it's not really human-centered, so to speak. So this information pillar, that was already a big question mark in traditional markets. And traditional market means that you move into a market environment, you look for offers, for products, perhaps you're incentivized to buy it, and then you choose. Modern markets are now different. They're new challenges. They're increasingly personalized, thanks to algorithms. Consumers do not need to end an online shop, to give an example, for advertising to work. Thanks to big data analytics, companies use behavioral patterns, our shopping behavior, and predict emotional responses needed to make us act. So how can we make an informed choice in this environment if we do not know anything about the user profiles that are building up um, about us? or use the language of data protection law. How can we design information so that the data subject is made aware of risk and rights in relation to the processing of personal data? And that's a big question in modern markets. And this all suggests a behavioral turn and legal design approaches. I've written down some options for improvement. If algorithms are used to make decisions, shouldn't get users a clear picture about it. 
that algorithms are used that you get the personalized information on Booking.com, that it's only the price you see, everyone else gets another price, individual priced. Shouldn't be there an information obligation to inform about the logic of an algorithm, about something what is really going on if you shop online. If algorithms use um, our people pattern for personalized shopping experience, shouldn't we think of personalized law that is tailored to individual uses so get away from the standardized disclosures, a set of 10 items what every consumer or user um, has a right to, to be informed about and move towards personalized disclosure. We've learned that icons may increase transparency. Couldn't we just put it in the law and say, hey, we put in how you have to present information. Think of buttons. We have this under the Consumer Rights Directive. Think of summary boxes, forms, designs, highlight rights and obligations. Um, you have mentioned, Antti, that the project involved translating 30 pages of terms of service yes. into something more meaningful. Yes. I was thinking, can't we write in a law that terms of service should never be longer than two pages? There's no obligation to use terms of service at all. And especially if we believe of consent, that information must be provided, information should, essential information should be never put in terms of service. Our members with 43 consumer organizations have um, been in court against Facebook, against WhatsApp, quite uh, successfully. Facebook was convicted that they had illegally put um, information in terms of conditions that were supposed to be presented to consumers. WhatsApp the same, they used English language, not an uh, average German consumer is not able to understand English te technical terms. So why not using the law for it, for legal design? And last, and this is perhaps a question for the audience of us, there was always the assumption that a digital native would have a comparable advantage over non or, or less tax savvy persons. <clears throat> I believe perhaps the opposite is true. The more data we feed into the system, the better will be the predictive outcome of an algorithm. The more we are on Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram, I think there will be one app very soon anyway, um, the less likely we will have a real choice. So the question would be, do we believe that data protection law is up to this challenge? Now I think I have only one minute to <laughs> describe what could be um, done with AI in order to achieve transparency, to have AI as a tool. And this is where legal design meets, again, algorithms. And Rosanna has mentioned... End of the session. Quite all right. Um, yeah, but I, I think we have uh, some few minutes more because we started uh, uh, after. So, hmm. Christoph, take your time. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, there are quite some projects now that are going on to develop AI in a tool to achieve transparency so that users, data subjects, can really um, figure out what is going on. One great project, of course, is your project, the Internet of Things, where Rosanna brilliantly works on a user empowerment tool, an app that looks through the lenses of legal design and thinks how we can um, give meaningful information to consumers. We're involved in this project, exciting to see how this will develop. Another project I would like to mention is the Claudette project. We work together with the European University Institute in Florence and the University of Bologna. We thought if machines can detect spam, machines can operate driverless cars, why can't we use a machine to enforce consumer and data protection rights? So Claudette is a software that automatic, automatically scans terms of services and gives you a legal analysis where the terms of service um, are in line with data protection law. You can go on claudette.eui.eu and test it at beuk.eu, our page. You will see a green light for privacy policies. <laughs> and then go try checking booking.com. Um, there are many more initiatives in this area. <coughs> I think I would just like to conclude to say that we should put a spotlight on this. How do we see AI as a tool for data protection watchdogs, consumer organizations, citizens, um, to make consumers and users aware of their rights as a citizen tool, and perhaps also traders that they would like to comply and have a closer look at their competitors. Finally, at the European Union, I can report as well that AI has been chosen being the next commission's priority. So there will be a lot of money going into this initiative. High-level groups have been built up. A high-level group on artificial intelligence, we are part of it. They think of how to ensure the uptake of AI in 
in the EU and how to ensure that AI is used ethically. There are also some guidelines on transparency which may go beyond the um, GDPR. Even a layperson, I quote, should be able to understand the complexity and causality mm. of algorithmic decision making and how it's implemented. That's quite a challenge. Since both the guidelines, the GDPR, consumer law, they are all silent on this issue. I think there's a strong presumption that this that confirms the hypothesis that legal design can help. Thanks. Thank you very much, Christo. <laughs> Uh, well, I know that uh, the launch uh, is just a few minutes away and a few steps away, uh, but if anyone want, has uh, any pressing question, we are really happy to hear from you. Yes, there is one. Come on, Zeta. Yeah, okay. Um, Isma? Uh, hello? if within the same uh, target group. And second, when graphic elements become vital and integral part of uh, if distributing information, how do you tackle, for instance, the problems with people with visual handicaps when they suddenly don't find their way through, let's say, the five tracks of, let's say, the, uh, the ladder? So these are two practical questions. Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, well, we can talk about that for a long time, but I would just like to say that Universal interpretation, like univoc univocal interpretation, is not the goal, cannot be the goal, in the sense that you cannot have an icon that is going to be interpreted e equally <coughs> across different user groups, across different cultures, across dif people that have different ages, different cultural backgrounds, different professions, okay? So I think that one of the solutions would be standardization and, of course, educational campaigns. Of course, you cannot have an icon of encry encryption and expect that people from that icon will understand what encry encryption means. Um, so, um, it's not an easy question. Of course, uh, misinterpretation is always possible, but there are some measures that we can take so that so we can ensure that there is the largest uh, possible um, uh, univocal, uh, at least uniform interpretation. And as for what concerns, um, of course, people that have visual impairments, uh, we are well aware of that. Uh, this is why also you use machine readable, um, I mean, uh, tools uh, that can read aloud what is in, in, for example, in a graphical element. Meaning that indeed you will be asking people to have indeed those textual elements instilled because if you have a purely, purely graphical element at that point. Well, there are. There are tools, uh, computer tools, that uh, they, they read, for example, what is, there is metadata in images and read, this is an image about this, and it tells this and this and this. You can embed metadata in images, and this is how you already go uh, along, uh, go ahead in this, uh, with this problem. Um, I got someone who's really eager to s ask her a question, because she already winked when I was still sitting over there, so I'm going to give her the word. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, interesting information. Um, it's not as much a question because I think everybody like me is hungry. So uh, it's more like uh, two remarks. Uh, first of all, um, in the GDPR, in Article 12.8, there's a mention of uh, standardized icons and actually the board uh, to give uh, advice on that. And I was just wondering for you guys who are mostly uh, academics, if there's in the future, in the future uh, anything planned to involve also the European level. And second of all is a, a small challenge, um, although I really appreciate most of you guys using uh, presentations, which uh, thank you for that. Uh, maybe some of the presentations can be also a bit more transparent, uh, because that's what we're all aiming for, is a transparent uh, approach in everything that we do. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, please. So concerning the, the first question, uh, we are in contact with so Buttarelli and also with uh, our authority in Italy. Uh, is in the plan uh, to... Uh, to present the methodology, first of all, uh, uh, as um, Ariana explained, and not the icons per se, that is a large uh, 
uh, uh, lot and room for improving and to adapt, but the main goal here is, uh, in our intention, is uh, to, to present uh, those methodology and those uh, theoretical uh, path and methodology to Buttarelli and to our uh, Italy, Italian authority in the next month. Is. Yes, thanks. And then I don't know whether by uh, making the slides more transparent, you were referring to the to make them available in open access. Uh, well, we will ask to the speakers, and uh, yeah, we could uh, publish the them online. Yeah, I, I don't know if you if I got uh, um, your question, if I understood it. Are there any more questions? No? Okay, so thank you very much for coming, and uh, we hope to see you Thanks. soon yeah, discussing so legal design. Thank you. Uh, yeah.